always have a bad wireless connection. What's up with that? So I don't know if I really have a bad wireless connection or not. What should we do? Should we check? I don't know if I should check. I'm gonna let it go. Hopefully it's not all pixelated, yada, yada, yada. Anyways, so I wanted to do a broadcast because I was reading Acts the other day and a really interesting part of the passage stood out to me that relates to Moses, something that I've never seen before. And it was in the middle of Stephen's uh, sermon right before he's killed. He's kind of making a case to um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that he's been brought before. And he starts to talk to them about, you know, how you've always, you always reject the prophets. And he goes through like this litany of things um, about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. And so there's this little bit in, in the passage about Moses that I wanted to talk about. I'd never really seen before. And I, I think it's going to do two things. One, I want to talk about when those closest to us, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I've experienced this a few times in my life from people that should really be like our biggest advocate in life. You ever have like a, like a mental picture of kind of who you are in your mind and you're like, I'm trying to move towards that. And then if you've ever tried to share that with somebody that you love or that, you know, is close to you, either like family or friends or even like an employer at times, like I've had stuff like that before and you're like, oh, I'm really interested in doing da 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 da. And they're like, oh, you wouldn't be good at that. Oh, I don't know about that. Maybe you shouldn't met that. It's probably not you. That I've had stuff like that happen to me and I think that you have too. But there's this part that in, in Acts that I want to read in just a second that has to talk, that kind of talks about that, that Moses actually went through that as well. I thought that was really interesting. And so I want to read it to you. And then I just want to talk about it a little bit. So we're going to read the Bible. If you have a Bible, you can open it up. I have one here. Ka-pa! Look, it's rose gold. Isn't that pretty? Not necessarily always love the translation, but, um, but I'm going to read you this part. And so if you know the story of Moses, most of you do, but um, I'm going to read it to you anyway. So I'm going to start in 20. So this is in 720. For those that don't know Moses, I'm going to give a couple lines of context. Then we're going to get to this key part. All right. So stick with me. All right. At that time, Moses was born and was fair in the sight of God. And he was reared for three months in his family's house. When he was put out, Pharaoh's daughter took him and reared him as her own son. Moses was educated in all wisdom of the Egyptians and powerful in words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, all right, so listen up. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the sons of Israel. But seeing one being wrong, he defended him and he avenged him who was oppressed and struck the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. On the next day, he appeared. Uh, on the next day, he appeared to them, and they fought and tried. And he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, "Men, your brothers, why do you wrong each other?" But the one who was wronging his neighbor pushed him away, saying, "Who appointed you as ruler and judge over us? Will you kill me as you killed the Egyptian?" Yesterday, Moses fled at this word and became a sojourner in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Okay, so two really interesting things about this. Everybody kind of knows Moses at the burning bush, right? Where the angel appears to Moses and he says, I've heard, you know, God's heard the oppression of his people. You got to go back. You got to deliver them. That was 40 years later. So Moses at 40, what we just read, this idea comes into his heart. And that's what I want to talk about. At times, God puts a thing in our heart. You know, we like just like Nehemiah and the walls, it says that it came into his heart to go back and to rebuild Jerusalem. So here Moses at 40 being reared in Pharaoh's house is all of a sudden he's like, I'm a Jew. And these are and these are Jews. I want to go see them. I want to go, you know, understand what they're doing and where they're at. So he goes there and he sees one of his brothers being wrong and he defends him, right? And he ends up killing the Egyptian. So that part I always know. But this this one line is so fascinating that Stephen puts in here. And it says he supposed, meaning he assumed that his brothers would understand that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So Moses at 40 
is already thinking that I am supposed to deliver these people, that surely I must have been reared in Pharaoh's house for a reason. I was set apart miraculously. Like that idea is already in his head at 40. 40 years before the burning bush happens. So I thought that that was just absolutely fascinating because there are times in our lives where we have things in our hearts at younger ages, like in your 30s, you know, or in your 20s, or even like you're 18 years old and you have this idea of I've been designed to do this thing and you kind of live through this incongruency or you have like foreshadowing of it and you kind of understand I'm supposed to do a thing but I don't really know how to do it and maybe you do it out of order. And so I just thought that was super fascinating. The other really interesting thing I took away from this is like this next line where the next day his brothers are arguing, he tries to reconcile him and then the one, the one who was doing the wronging, right? Like the one who was sinning, pushes Moses away and says, who appointed you ruler and judge over us? Will you also kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Again, a ton of foreshadowing. 40 years before God actually appoints him as ruler, judge, and redeemer for the Israelites. Here you have somebody... And the devil knows. This is what this was the other, I think, interesting takeaway is oftentimes the devil knows your identity better than those around you or even yourself. It's like he understands who Moses is. Who appointed you ruler and judge over us? And it's because God is going to appoint him as ruler and judge. And then and then the thing that's super also interesting, I think, is that it says that Moses fled at this word. And there are a lot of times, you know, especially when you kind of feel like a like an unripe banana you kind of feel like a green banana but you're like I know I'm supposed to do something and you try to step into that god-given identity and role and assignment there are times where you get real demonic pushback for that and in, and in such a way so much so like in Moses's case Moses fled from it Moses Moses fled. So here he's almost like a man without a home, right? He's not Egyptian. He's fully aware he's not Egyptian, so much so that it enters his heart that he wants to go visit his brothers. He tries to connect with his brothers, but his brothers also reject him. And so he has no place to go. And at that, I think it's that type of a thought and mindset that drives him into the wilderness for 40 years. It says he became a sojourner in the land of Midian, where he became a father to two sons. And so so then it's like Moses has this 40 years, I think, of, of really understanding probably what it means more so to be a Jew, right? Of being um, essentially brought alongside Jethro and getting married and having two sons. He almost has 40 years of really trying to understand who the Lord is, who the Jewish people are. And then he has that burning bush encounter. But I wanted to talk about it because, I mean, outside of probably Joseph, where Joseph has a vision of who he is and his brothers don't understand it, they don't, it, 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 and kind of, and so much so that they sell him into slavery, they're so frustrated by it. Um, as Christians, we have these incongruencies of God puts a thing in our heart to do, and you might be young or you might be older it doesn't matter but it's like he has these things that it's like we get these things in our heart and there's just incongruencies and sometimes even when we share those things with the people closest to us like in joseph's case right his brother sold him into slavery or in moses's cake case he's completely rejected that those things happen and in spite of those things you have to know how, what God's called you to do. And you have to step out in faith and do those things. And it's like, you have to believe in you. Don't look for, for affirmation outside of what God has asked you to do. And that's a word, you know, I've had to speak to myself a few times. You know, I remember, you know, like, like I said, I mean, just working for different people. Like I used to work for two financial advisors, great guys. And I was like, oh, I could be a financial advisor. I can do this. I can do that. And then one of them was like, Oh, you couldn't do that. Like, you yeah, wouldn't be good at that. You know, or even when you share things with your family, it's like, hey, I'm thinking about, I think I'm about like investing in real estate. And it's like, oh, that's so risky. I don't know. I don't know if you should do that. You know, it's sometimes we let those words speak to us. And like the people you want to champion you the most don't end up doing that. And so I just want to exhort you. Don't look to the right or to the left and look for somebody else's affirmation. When you have a thing that enters your heart, I think two things. Be obedient to what you're being called to do and you believe in you. You have to believe in you enough to move 
forward into the thing God's asking you to do and don't look to your right or to your left. And then the other thing is expect pushback, expect strong demonic pushback, because as much as you're trying to find confirmation that you are who you really think that you are, um, and you're fighting like an imposter syndrome, the devil actually knows who you are. And you'll have people that are gonna push against you, just like Joseph's brothers, and just like the the Israelites here with Moses, that, that it's like, who appointed you ruler and judge over us? Well, newsflash, 40 years, 80 years in the future, he is that guy. And so it's like, he knows. So don't let him rob that from you either. Don't Don't let him force you into like, running away from the thing that God's called you to do out of fear or um, just feeling like you don't fit in. And, f and honestly, I mean, most innovators feel that way. You know, you feel like, I don't know if I fit in anywhere. It's just the things that I'm thinking about doing, no one's thought about doing before or a handful of people are. So anyways, I thought that was so cool. That's from Stephen Sermon uh, in Acts 7, right before he's uh, murdered for all of it. It's a really interesting sermon too, because he makes this case and he uses the, you know, who the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees really respect, which are um, they're the fathers, right? The fathers of the faith. Abraham's our father. Moses is our father. And so he makes this case that, no, you have always rejected the prophets. You've always rejected the ones that God sent you. And so he uses the case of Moses, um, of how they rejected him then. Um, and then they rejected him again when they, they built the, the cow. And, um, and so he says all those things. He goes, no, you, you're a, he says, you're stiff necked and like uncircumcised, uh, ear, uh, of hearing. And so, so then they get really offended. So anyways, it's really, it's a great little sermon. You should go check it out and read it, but hopefully this has blessed you. So, like I'm saying, you believe in you. It's enough. You believe in you and you believe in the thing that's entered your heart to do, just like Nehemiah, just like Moses. And you go and pursue that thing. Don't look to the right or to the left. And forgive those people who don't see what God's put in your heart. Forgive them. They don't see you, okay? It's like, like the Bible says, a prophet's never respected in his own town. These people have seen you at your best. They've seen you at your worst. And so you have to forgive them too and say, you know what? They just don't have eyes to see. That's okay. But I'm going to move in this direction. I'm going to pursue this thing that God's put in my heart that I have this desire to do. And sometimes too, don't overcomplicate it. Sometimes too, you simply have a desire in your heart. You don't necessarily need three angels and a spoken word of the Lord to know that it's God's will to do a thing. That a lot of times God just moves. Like when you read like Mo what Moses here, you go read Nehemiah, it's like they have this desire. All of a sudden it's like this desire to do something, this strong desire, and they want to move towards it. So, and then they ask God to bless it. So anyways, hopefully good word for you all today on this Monday. And that's it. I'll keep it nice and short. All right, guys, talk to you later. Bye.